Don't pull at it, my mother said. Let it come out on its own. The tooth fairy will give you a dollar for it. When I'd first noticed the tooth, wedged between the other small, pearly ones on the lower right of my mouth, it had filled me with a joy that I've never experienced the same as an adult. The occasion was special to me, as it had been my first loose tooth. Back in those days, my mother's word had been law to me. I had to wait. My little body ached with anticipation of waiting. Eventually, I couldn't resist the temptation of pulling any more. I gnawed on the hardest foods I could find. Taffy, apples, carrot chips, nuts and the like. My fingers had tugged on it until I had lost sensation in them. I lost track of the countless times where I probed it with my tongue, desperate for it to finally be out so I could get a visit from the tooth fairy. But no matter what I seemed to do, the tooth refused to leave my mouth. It seemed that the harder I tried to remove it, the deeper it dug itself into my gums. My seventh birthday came and passed that summer, and it had been a good one. My parents had treated me to go co-karting at the local amusement park with cake and ice cream afterwards. The fun that I had overshadowed my anxiety about my loose tooth. It was already dark when our car had pulled into our driveway. I had stirred from the sleep I'd fallen into on the ride home and somehow managed to groggily drag myself out of the car and into the house and slumped down onto my own bed without a single hesitation. I don't know how late it was when the jangling woke me. There was a distinctly metal click to it, like the friction of a dozen small objects, all rubbing together in a cluster. It reminded me of the sound of my father's front pockets, always stuffed with spare change. I sat up in bed, half buried in my Thundercats bedsheets, as my bleary eyes adjusted to the darkness of my room. My heart clenched in my chest as a familiar childhood fear took over. The familiarity of the room, which I had taken for granted in the daylight, was now lost to darkness, and in my young mind, anything could be lurking out there. I was grateful for the light that peeked into my room from my half-open bedroom door. Something shuffled on the landing outside my bedroom door. Squinting closer, I could see the outline of a tall, shadowy figure moving about. I blinked. Mom? Dad? The figure stopped, inching its head towards the direction of my voice. A chill coursed down my spine, and I didn't even know why. The footsteps trod closer, almost inaudible, towards the direction of my room, stopping just a few inches before my bedroom door. Then, the door creaked open. I sagged in relief at seeing the dark, humanoid outline frame against the open light pouring into my room. It was tall enough for me to think that it was just one of my parents, and my chest sagged in relief. I expected some hushed words of comfort and to be tucked into my bed. Any sense of relief died the moment that figure stepped closer, and I saw it more clearly. The billowing outline, which I assumed were pyjamas, were trailing, weather-beaten red robes. A hood poured over its bowed head as it hobbled along my bedroom floor, its leaves bearing its hands. It seemed to glide on its feet rather than walk, with a kind of fluidity that I'd only seen in professional ice skaters. Even at that age, I had the sense to know it wasn't natural. I couldn't see its feet under its tented clothes, but I was sure that they hadn't touched the floor once. It paused by the foot of my bed, and just stood there, like a wind-up figure that had lost its momentum. Suddenly, it lifted its head towards me. It had no eyes, no nose either, 
or any normal facial features that I had come to recognize. It was as if someone had sculpted a human face from raw meat, the glistening bloody folds of its skin sagging over its bones, as if it was rotting and live, looking ready to fall off in meaty chunks. The only recognizable part of its face was its gaping mouth filled with rows of mismatched teeth, some white, others yellow, of varying shapes and sizes. Its breath was sticky and labored, as if it was drowning in its own lungs. A stale smell of mothballs and morphine filled the air. It grinned down at me, a thin trail of saliva slithering down its chin. Before I could scream, it was already on me. It materialized from across the room, pinning me to the bed with a large, fleshy hand pressed to my mouth. I knew that there was no resisting it. It was at least twice the size of me, with its forearm being almost as long as my torso. The sharp crack of bone rang out as it jerked its neck upwards, jaws unhinging so wide that I was sure its skull would rip apart from the sheer force. Frothy saliva flecked under my skin as it let out a soft, choking sound. In the waning moonlight that peered through my curtains, I saw it didn't have rows of teeth. It had layers. Dozens of misshapen teeth that ringed the side of its mouth to the pale upper palate, stretching down into its gullet. More than I could count at that age. It reminded me of a lamprey, the kind I'd seen in a half-remembered National Geographic documentary when I'd been flicking through the channels one day. My eyes widened with mute horror, glistening with tears. Every cell in my body screamed out for my parents to save me from this thing, but even if I could manage to move the massive hand from my mouth, my voice was lodged in my throat. It descended on my squirming form, engulfing my head inside the fleshy cavern of its mouth and muffling my cries for help. My fists battered helplessly against the spongy sides of its skull, but it didn't flinch. Vomit burned at the back of my throat at its rancid cabbage breath that blew into my face. Something long and dark coiled out of the pulsating depths of its throat like a black mamba a forked tip flicking up before my helpless eyes. Just as I realized that the object was its tongue, it plunged into my own mouth. The ringed muscles of my esophagus tightened as the mass pushed deeper into my throat, squeezing the air out of me. The underside was covered in what felt like fleshy suckers that stuck to the side of my mouth as it slithered about. My head throbbed from the lack of oxygen, feeling ready to explode into fragments. After what felt like an eternity of it examining my mouth, it came across my loose baby tooth. It gave it a few experimental jabs, as fascinated by its slackness as I had been. The tip retracted from my throat, coiling around the area. Pain rocketed through my body as I felt the hooked edge of its fat, wriggling tongue hook to the underside of the tooth, deep into the gum, pulling upwards. I knew what it was trying to do, and my efforts to fight it off became frantic as claustrophobia weighed down on me, struggling against the inhuman body to no avail. The wet walls tightened around my skull. I was sure that it was about to swallow me whole, a wet pop resounded like a gunshot through my brain as I found myself falling backwards onto my bed, freed from the humid heat. Bloody drool mixed with acrid vomit was sprayed onto my pillow. I clutched the aching side of my jaw as blood seeped from the corner of my mouth, ribcage expanding with involuntary gasps and retching. It stood over me balancing my bloody tooth on the sharp tip of its black, serpentine tongue, almost looking down at it 
with non-existent eyes. It slurped it back into the confines of its mouth, chewing down with a watery crunch of splintering enamel. When it opened its mouth again, I saw that the incisor on the upper left of its mouth had a new neighbor. A small white tooth stifled between it and a large cavity pocketed molar. My tooth. Its mouth contorted into a sickening smile, its hand moving to rummage around inside the folds of its robes, looking for something. Reaching around, it took something under my pillow before pursing a bony finger to its skinless grin. Its fingernail cracked and blackened. I passed out with that horrible face still looming over me, burned forever into my mind. When I had failed to show up for breakfast the next morning, my mother instantly knew something was wrong. She had come up to my room to find me half slumped out of bed on the floorboards in a pool of my own half-dried blood. After rushing me to the hospital and getting my wounds tended to, they concluded that I must have hit my mouth on the side of my dresser while getting up in the middle of the night and passed out from the pain. From the concerned smiles on their faces, I knew that they hadn't seen it. I was all too content to let them believe that. I didn't have the words yet to describe what had happened that night. It took several days after the incident before I had the courage to look under my pillow to see what the creature had left for me. I flinched as my fingers curled around the edges of something solid and smooth and I forced myself to pull it out. I had stared down at it, my mouth dry the side profile of Susan B. Anthony shown up from a worn silver dollar, with 1979 emblazoned along the bottom. Though they searched every inch of my room, my parents never found my tooth. They never found any of the other baby teeth I lost in the years to come. I buried them all in the backyard, afraid that it would return. No money in the world was worth having to go through it again. When my very last baby tooth fell out, I wept. Even growing up didn't grant me an escape from it. Every time I closed my eyes, there would always be a brief flash of its face. Visits to the dentists became a regular source of dread. Whenever I was reclined backwards in the leather chair, with a masked face positioned over me with a spinning drill, I got heart palpitations. When I was younger, I broke down completely. After all I'd went through, I thought that I would never see it again. I was wrong. When my six-year-old daughter, Mia, proudly poked at a loose tooth at the bottom front row of her teeth, I had smiled along with my wife, even as my heart had plunged into the pits of my stomach. That lifelong dread resurfaced in the back of my mind, reshaping itself into a question. Would it come for her? I had wanted to believe that it was all a figment of my concussed imagination. It didn't stop me from installing motion sensor lights in her backyard. I told my wife it was for protection. I knew better. It was after I had put Mia to bed, her rotating fairy lamp casting dancing shadows across her pastel pink walls. I had headed downstairs to fix myself a cup of tea before I settled in beside my already sleeping wife. As I was tapping my spoon against the edge of the cup, the light blinked on behind me, notifying of motion detected in the backyard. I froze over the steaming beige pool, fingers clenching around the handle until my knuckles turned white. Probably just a raccoon, I told myself. I made myself check, forcing my stiffened leg muscles to walk to the direction of the glass patio doors, where I'd hoped the concealed view would ease my fears. I found myself facing my own pale reflection in the glass, 
against the outside darkness. I'd been just about to return to bed when the lights flicked on again. A figure was crouched in the darkness, dark and almost shapeless. A hooded head jerked in my direction, our gazes meeting for the first time in over 30 years with just a pane of glass between us. Though its face was hidden in shadow, I knew exactly who, or rather what it was. My breath slowed to a halt as I looked at it. I only discovered that my cup of tea had fallen from my hands and the hot liquid singed my toes. The pinkish glow above, where it was fixated at, jolted me back into reality. My heart froze. Mia's room. Parental instinct overrode any sense of self-preservation as I charged out the door at it. It darted into the cover of the trees bordering our house, tripping over its elongated limbs. It soon slipped out of my sight, far beyond where I could chase it. I didn't find any peace in watching it leave, but a queasy dread pooling within me. This wouldn't be the last time. Something glimmered from the ground, having rolled out of the folds of its cloak. Without even thinking, I picked it up to inspect it. I let out a choking wheeze, almost dropping it. Somehow, I managed to hold on, unable to let go of it, no matter how much fear it instilled in me. A single, old, silver dollar. 